Hi everyone, my name is John Lawler and I'm a graduate student here at UMass and my talk today is titled Building an Evaluation Scale for Natural Language Processing Using Item Response Theory. Uh, this is joint work I did with Professor Hao Wu out of Boston College and my advisor Professor Hong Yu out of the medical school the adjunct here at CS. Uh, we presented this work at EMNLP uh, this past fall. So a little motivation about the topic before we really get into it. Um, if you think about the evaluation metrics that have been used for natural language processing tasks, they haven't really changed much as the field has evolved. Um, we still measure accuracy, precision, recall, these types of um, metrics. And the inherent assumption with these metrics is that each example in your test set is equally important. Um, you know, we disagree with this assumption and we believe that not all test set examples are created equal. So you have some easy items, some hard items, very many items in between, <clears throat> and we think that the characteristics of the individual items are important when evaluating a model. Um, these existing metrics don't take these characteristics into consideration. So we propose to use what's called item response theory from the field of psychometrics to model and describe the characteristics of individual examples. Um, for example, the difficulty and the discriminating power of these items. Item response theory is able to account for these characteristics uh, and also estimate ability for a task using these characteristics. So basically what IRT does is it considers how easy the correctly answered examples are and then it places the performance in a scope of a human population. So it's very popular in standardized tests, for example, where it can evaluate an individual based on the questions it answers correctly, and then place that individual in the context of a larger uh, population of individuals who have taken the test. So here's a brief outline of the talk. Um, I'm going to introduce item response theory, go into a little more detail about the models that we use. Um, then I'll talk about the task that we tested this on, uh, recognizing textual entailment. Um, I'll then talk about how we collected our data and how we fit our models go into our results, our conclusions, and if we have time, I'll talk about some ongoing and future work. So first, item response theory. So as a brief introduction, as I mentioned, item response theory is a methodology from psychometrics for scale construction and evaluation. When we talk about scales, we mean uh, tests, basically. It's, it's used to, to build tests that are given to humans, evaluate, the quality of those tests, and then also uh, evaluate the performance of individuals on those tests. Um, IRT can jointly model individual ability and item characteristics. So we'll talk a little bit about just some of the IRT terminology um, because it's going to come up a lot in these slides, and I want to make sure we're kind of on the same page. Uh, when we say an item, an item refers to a single example. So one example from your test set would be an item. Um, a response pattern is a set of responses to all of your items. So uh, if an individual were to take a test, that individual's responses to all of the test questions would be their response pattern. Uh, translate that over to our scenario, and you have a model's output on the test set would be its response pattern. Next, we have the evaluation scale, which is a calibrated set of items to be administered. So from your set of items, you fit your model and you remove a few items that don't fit the model well, <clears throat> and you end up with an evaluation scale, so it's a subset of those original items, and that's then your new test set. Uh, ability score, also known as your theta score, is a score assigned to an individual based on her responses to your evaluation scale items. So basically, instead of recording accuracy on your test set, we would start to record ability score or your theta score on your IRT evaluation scale set. Uh, as I mentioned, IRT widely used in educational testing. Um, it's useful in the construction and evaluation of actual tests. So how to decide if an item is good for consideration to be included in the test. Uh, once you include an item in a test, you can then go and evaluate the test and see how well, how good of a job it does. Uh, and then also for scoring these tests, when you have individuals who then take the test, you want to be able to score their ability according to IRT. Um, so, for example, it's useful in the test of English as a foreign language and the GRE 
number of other standardized tests as well. Um, so now by fitting an IRT model for our NLP task using a pre-gathered set of human labels, we can score an NLP system using IRT. So we can basically take this concept that's useful in scoring humans and score an NLP model. Uh, as an added bonus, this IRT score, because we have to fit it with a lot of human data, uh, it places an NLP system's performance in the context of a human population. So not only will we get this theta score, but it will tell us how well the system performs with respect to a larger human population. The IRT models make a few assumptions, and we'll briefly go through them here. Uh, first, we assume that individuals differ from each other on an unobserved latent trait, which is called ability. Um, Second, the probability of correctly answering an item is a function of the person's ability, as we'll see in the actual model description. Third is what we call the local independence assumption. Responses to different items are independent of each other for a given ability level. Um, so what this means is we want a set of items that are independent from each other so that the responses to one are not dependent on the responses from another. Finally, responses from different individuals are independent of each other. And self-explanatory, we don't want the responses to be dependent across individuals. So now we'll introduce the actual item response theory model that we used in these experiments. It's called the three-parameter logistic model. <clears throat> um, what we're trying to do here for each item, I, in this case, we want to model the probability that an individual, J, answers item I correctly. Um, so this this is a function of an individual's ability level, and we have these three parameters in the model A, B, and C. So for a given item, A is what's called the discrimination parameter, and that's basically how well the item discriminates between individuals at different levels of ability. B is our difficulty parameter, and that refers to the ability level at which the probability of answering the item correctly is 50%. And then finally, we have our guessing parameter, C, and that refers to um, just the likelihood of guessing the question correctly. So even at the lowest levels of ability, if there is some percent chance that the question will be answered correctly, that's reflected in our guessing parameter. So this is what's called an item characteristic curve. This is the result of fitting the model in the, from the previous slide. You have one curve, for, you have a curve for each individual item. Uh, they all have a kind of logistic shape to them, depending on the parameters. Um, so what we see here is a curve that has some degree of guessing involved because uh, at the negative, very low ability levels, we see that the probability of answering correctly is uh, above 0.2. Uh, so quickly, on the x-axis, we have our ability metric. And then on the y-axis, we have the probability of answering this item correctly. Uh, at the different levels of ability. <clears throat> so if we look at this curve, uh, we see that it's relatively average in terms of difficulty, right around zero, maybe a little less than zero in terms of ability. The probability of answering correctly is 0.5. Um, we have a pretty good slope in terms of discriminating ability. Um, at low levels of ability, the probability of answering correctly is low, and at high levels, it's fairly high, so this is good. Uh, and as I mentioned, the guessing parameter is right above 0.2. Uh, in terms of ranges for ability, the common range for when you're evaluating humans in terms of ability is negative 3 to 3. Um, so we kept that in our evaluations as well because we figured that um, our NLP model would fit within that range. So now <clears throat> we'll talk briefly about fitting the actual models. Um, what you want to do is maximize the probability of, of, of observing your current response patterns as a function of the item parameters. In order to do this, you integrate out the human ability parameters and just focus on the item parameters. Uh, you fit this with expectation maximization. Um, and then once your model is fit, you can estimate ability according to a normal distribution. Um, a big part of this process is, so before I get to that, um, this is a fairly common methodology in the psychometric community, and there's a lot of software out there that does the heavy lifting for you, um, particularly in R. So we used an R package for fitting our models. <clears throat> the um, difficult piece of this is when it comes time to uh, 
decide whether to retain or remove a particular item in the model. Um, you want to make sure that you have a good set of items that covers a, a range of difficulty levels and discrimination parameters, um, but you have to make sure that they fit your assumptions from earlier. So what you have to do is you test your local independent assumption. If there are item pairs that are highly correlated, uh, you remove them. And then you also have to test the fit of the individual item characteristic curves to make sure that your response patterns fit with the curves that, you're be that are being modeled. So now we're just going to look at a few examples of item characteristic curves just to see how varying different parameters lead to different curves. Uh, I will say these uh, images come from uh, Frank Baker's original book on item response theory, which is relatively old and it kind of reflects in these plots, um, but they're effective, so I included them. So here we look at the uh, changes in the plots if you vary your difficulty parameter while keeping your discrimination parameter the same. So if we go kind of from left to right, if we look at this first curve, we see that um, the difficulty level is fairly low because the probability of answering correct is 0.5 when the ability level is you know, about negative 1.5. <clears throat> so this question is fairly easy. You don't need a very high level of ability to have 50% chance of answering correctly. Uh, moving left to right again, the middle curve, this is a kind of average question where the probability of answering correctly is around 0.5 when ability is at zero. Um, and then the last curve here, the probability of getting it right at 0.5 is when your ability level is above one, or one and a half, almost two. So this is a very difficult item, frankly. Uh, and as you see, even at a very high ability level of three, the probability of answering correctly um, is about 0.8. So it doesn't even get up to you know, 0.91. So that would definitely be a hard item. So now we'll look at if we vary the discrimination parameter um, while holding the difficulty parameter fixed. So the straight line there has a very low discrimination parameter. Um, and this is not useful in terms of building a test set because as you change theta levels, as you change ability levels, um, the probability of answering it correctly does not increase enough to make the item worthwhile for inclusion into the test set because you know the, the degree of change isn't enough to show that the item can distinguish between levels of ability. So for example, if we look at right around negative one, the difference between ability of negative one and zero uh, it, the probability of answering correctly is not uh, not that big. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the slightly steeper slope curve uh, that has a higher discriminating ability, and so this would be better for our test set because at as theta changes, um, the slope shows that the probability of answering correctly increases uh, at a faster rate. The best option in terms of an item for inclusion is the last curve. <clears throat> Here, the uh, probability of answering correctly changes at a, a pretty good amount uh, in between negative one and one. So it does a good job of discriminating between those levels of ability. Now, we don't want to go too far down this road because if we have perfect discrimination, like in this plot here, um, this item only discriminates between individuals right around ability level of 1.5. So if you're 1.4 or 1.6, this item will do a very good job identifying you in terms of ability. But anywhere else on the ability scale, this item is not useful. So this is a kind of item you wouldn't want to include. So now, that said, we're going to talk a little bit about recognizing textual entailment. Um, when we decided to try this um, methodology in natural language processing, we had to pick a task, basically. Um, and we went with natural language. We went with recognizing textual entailment because, uh, as we'll see in some of the examples, there it's an ambiguous task. Uh, so we thought it would work well in this scenario. So first, just to talk about the task itself, um, if you were given two sentences, a premise and a hypothesis, the goal of recognizing entailment is to say that if the premise is true, what can we infer about the hypothesis? So there are three three possible answers for this. Um, if P being true implies that H is true, you have entailment. If P being true implies that H is false, you have a contradiction. 
and if P and H are unrelated, you just have a neutral pair of sentences. So now just for a few examples, you can see here we've included an example of entailment, an example of contradiction, an example of neutral. <clears throat> um, so for example, for your entailment, the premise that a woman is a woman is kneeling on the ground taking a photograph, uh, and with the hypothesis a picture is being snapped, you can say that if the premise is true, um, someone is taking a photograph, therefore a picture is being snapped. So that's kind of clearly an entailment. Um, same with the contradiction example. If people are watching the tournament in the stadium, then they are not sitting outside in the grass. So we have a contradiction. The neutral, the two sentences just aren't required. You don't have the girls don't have to be sisters. Um, if they're dancing on a bridge with the city skyline in the background. Now this last example is interesting um, because it's very ambiguous. And I say it's ambiguous because it depends on the uh, individual who reading these sentences, whether they think it's a contradiction or not. So for me, being from the United States, I would say this is definitely a contradiction because if you're playing soccer, you're not playing football. However, if you ask somebody from most any other place in the world, um, they would probably think that this was entailment because if you have soccer players and then you have football players, they would possibly assume that we mean soccer, that we mean football in the uh, you know, global sense. So something like this, there's a lot of ambiguity in the, you know, maybe we're not totally sure that it is a contradiction. Uh, so this is something we need to take into account when we're building our models for, uh, for our IRT uh, model fitting. So we have the task um, in terms of the original data set that we um, used. It's called the Stanford Natural Language Inference Corpus. Um, this is a recently released data set for entailment. Um, it's much larger than, than previous RTE resources. And the nice thing about it is that all of the sentences in the data set were human generated. Um, a lot of RTE data uh, was at least semi-automatically generated. Uh, so here we have sentences that were written by humans. <clears throat> um, the way they generated the data set was that they took that all of the premise sentences were obtained from another data set called the Flickr 30,000 corpus. And these were basically um, individuals on Amazon Mechanical Turk were shown photos and were asked to write a caption for the photo. So those captions were extracted, and that's what was used for the premises here. Um, and to obtain the hypotheses, uh, another Amazon Mechanical Turk task was created where the Turkers uh, were shown the premise sentence without the image and asked to write three related sentences to that premise, one for entailment, one for contradiction, and one for neutral. Um, a nice thing about the data set was that a subset was randomly selected and subject to a quality control where they presented the sentence pairs to four additional uh, Turkers for labeling. So that way they had five labels for these this subset of data, four from the new uh, quality control annotators and then the first one from the individual who actually wrote the sentence. Okay, so now we're going to talk a bit about our data collection and how we fit our models. Um, we worked with a subset of this SNLI data set. Uh, what we did is we picked 180 items from the quality control selection that I mentioned earlier for additional labeling on Amazon Turk. So in order to fit these IRT models, you need a large amount of data. So we obtained a thousand labels per sentence pair for these 180 items. The way we made our selections was based on how many annotators agreed on the original gold label. So we had what we called our five GS items where all five annotators agreed, split 30-30-30 um, 30, 30, 30 between the labels. And then we had our four GS items where four or five annotators agreed. Again, the same 30-30-30 30, 30, 30 split. So that left us with six subsets of data, um, four and five GS, and then the three labels. Uh, in terms of our task, we presented Amazon Mechanical Turk workers with either the entire 5GS data set or the entire 4GS data set to provide labels, um, one premise hypothesis pair at a time. So we had a, a web app set up where the users would go, give us some initial demographic information, 
and then once one sentence pair at a time they'd be given the premise and hypothesis and they were asked if the premise hypothesis is true if the premise is true excuse me <clears throat> um, can you infer that the what can you infer about the hypothesis and the options were uh, it must be true can't be true or um, unrelated uh, in terms of uh, obtaining workers for the task we uh, did an initial screening for individuals who had a 97 percent or higher approval rating just as a kind of indicator of high quality and also individuals who were located in America uh, as a proxy for English-speaking workers uh, in addition we had a few attention check questions throughout the task uh, just to make sure people were paying attention they weren't just clicking and, and hitting next um, and that filtered out a few responses so now, once we obtained that data, we had to fit our IRT models. Um, what we did was we fit one model per subset of data that we had. So the 5GS entailment, for example, or 4GS contradiction, each of those subsets were fit with a separate IRT model. <clears throat> and we did that because in our initial factor analysis of the response patterns that we got from uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, we found that there were three latent factors in the uh, in the response patterns that matched up with the original gold label of the items so uh, what we did was we split the items according to their label and then tested a single factor model and found that each data set was related to a single latent factor um, so you can interpret this in thinking about the ability parameter um, for a fit IRT model so in each of our cases, we can say that the um, ability metric that we're measuring uh, can be considered as the ability to recognize that particular label. So for our 5GS entailment group, for example, the theta score would be um, interpreted as the ability to measure entailment in a sentence pair. So before we actually did the fitting of the models, we had to remove any sentence pairs that were clearly that had a lot of ambiguity or discrepancies in them. So for example, the soccer football example from earlier, that was removed before fitting the model just due to the ambiguity um, that I mentioned earlier with the soccer football um, discrepancies. So for each of those data sets, what we did was we fit a three parameter logistic model, um, but then for each item, we tested the significance of the guessing parameter. Uh, and if the guessing parameter wasn't significantly different than zero, we just removed it and we fit a two parameter model for that item. Uh, and it ended up with a mixed model across all the items, which is, um, you know, it's, it's fairly common practice. You can just consider the two parameter models as a three parameter where C is equal to zero. Um, and that works fine. So then uh, in terms of removing items, as I mentioned earlier, it was an iterative process. We would first check to see if any of the items had a poor fit to the model. Uh, if they did, we would remove them. Uh, and then also, if the discriminating parameter was too low, we would remove them. Because again, we want items that do a good job of discriminating between ability levels. Um, and then we would refit our model with the new subset of items and repeat the process until we didn't have to remove any more items. Um, in, our, in our tests, we found that this process took two to five steps depending on the uh, depending on the subset of data. So now we're going to talk through our results. Um, just the different sections that we're going to deal with. They're going to talk about like the Amazon Turk responses, um, some of the items that we retained, some of the items that we removed, and then also uh, an evaluation task on an NLP model to see actually how how well this worked. So we're going to start with some data about the Turkers. Uh, because we had so many labels for each of our items, we wanted to see how well these individuals agreed with each other. Um, so we did first, we wanted to check uh, just overall majority agreement. Uh, and it's very high, which is what you would expect. Um, this is kind of just a very rough sanity check to make sure that the sentence pairs are OK. Um, we also wanted to see if how many pairs had a super majority agreement. Um, and this is lower, as you would expect, again. What was interesting is um, the supermajority agreement was higher for the 5GS items than the 4GS items. Um, 
So you could kind of think of the 4GS items as being a little more difficult than the 5GS items. Um, you know, that's that's the kind of interpretation we're going with because um, we, we kind of consider here in this case the uh, lack of con uh, consensus as a measure of difficulty. That's just kind of an assumption we're making here that we can see later when we look at the item parameters. Uh, next, we looked at inter-annotator agreement. Um, in the original paper, in the far right there, you see that it's very high. Uh, again, as you would expect with the 1,000 labels, um, it's going to be lower than if you just have five individuals. Um, so again, this kind of highlights the ambiguity of the task. And again, note that the, the 4GS agreement was lower than the 5GS agreement. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk quickly about just how the model fitting went. So we had 180 sentence pairs to start, as I mentioned, uh, 30 per data subset. We removed six before we fit our models um, with the, you know, to remove any of those discrepancies that I mentioned earlier. So when all of the items were, when all of the models were fit, excuse me, we ended up with 124 items, uh, roughly 69% of our total sentence pair set. Um, just as a note, we weren't able to fit a model for the 4GS entailment data set, so all of those items were removed. Um, just the way that the response patterns matched, we weren't able to fit a good model that considered that contained enough items to be useful as a test set. So now let's look at uh, an item that was removed for bad item fit. So we see here uh, the dotted line is the um, rough response pattern plot, and the solid line is the estimated item characteristic curve. So the response plot, um, it doesn't match up with that curve at all. With an item response curve, with an item characteristic curve, you really want a continually increasing function because as ability goes up, you really, you know, the assumption is the probability of answering the question correctly will go up as well. So as you see, this kind of increases, then decreases and goes up again. Uh, this is a bad item, so we removed it. Next, we're going to compare a couple of items with different discriminating abilities. Um, so the solid line is the item characteristic curve for one of the items that we retained. You can see that it does a very good job of discriminating um, kind of slightly below average individuals. So right around ability level of negative one, very low probability of answering correctly. But then uh, for an ability level of zero, the probability jumps up again, jumps even higher for one. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, we have uh, the dotted line there is the curve for an item that ended up being removed because it had a very uh, discriminating ability parameter that was too low. So if you look at this curve, even at a very low ability level, like negative three, um, the probability of answering correctly is already above 0.5. So this item doesn't do a good job of discriminating at any reasonable level of ability, so we remove the item. Um, here's a few examples of some of the sentence pairs that were retained, some that were removed. Uh, I'm going to just highlight a few of these. First, we're going to look at um, item nine here. Uh, a man on stilts in a purple, yellow, and white costume. And then the hypothesis was a man is performing on stilts. So this entailment item, this was the one from two slides ago with the uh, goofy up and down response pattern curve. So this one was removed. Next, we look at number four and number eight. These were from the previous slide. Um, one item with the very, very low discriminating parameter, which was number eight, and then um, one with the good discriminating parameter, which was number four. And if you look at number eight, um, with your premise being a couple is back-to-back -back in formal attire, and the hypothesis being two people are facing away from each other, uh, this is the kind of question that everybody got right, so it's not useful in terms of uh, being included in a test set, so it was removed. Now, this plot here, um, what we did once we had our fit models is we went and scored the individuals from Amazon Mechanical Turk and generated a theta score for each of them. Uh, and then we plotted the number of questions they answered correctly against their theta score, and that's what we have here. So what's interesting to note is if you look at, say, this uh, section that's highlighted, um, you have individuals where, I mean, across the whole plot, 
the same number of correct answers leads to a different theta score because it depends on which questions were answered correctly. So you have a situation here where someone who answered ten questions, a particular ten questions correctly, um, could have the same the same theta score as somebody who answered a particular fourteen or thirteen questions correctly, but just those different correct answer patterns can give you the same theta score even if the number correct is different. It kind of goes back to our whole, whole main point of which questions that you answer correctly matters, not just how many. So next um, we're going to look at just some of the item parameters from the finished fit models, uh, particularly the kind of maximum difficulty. So as I mentioned earlier, you can make the assumption that um, those five GS items were easier than the four GS items. Uh, if you assume that you know, uh, lack of um, unanim unanimous decision in the labeling is a proxy for difficulty, um, but that assumption kind of plays itself out here when you look at the difficulty parameters for the items. Uh, so the highest difficulty in the five gold standard sets, particularly contradiction and neutral, um, are lower than the highest difficulty for the 4GS sets. So you have items that are more difficult in your 4GS data set that matches up with our assumption um, that the data set as a whole is, is more difficult. So we have our model, we have our item parameters. Now what we want to do is actually test this on a um, an NLP model for recognizing entailment. So uh, with the original uh, SNLI data set that was released, they also released a, um, uh, an LSTM neural network for testing. So what we did was we took that network, we trained it on the full SNLI training set, and then instead of using their test set, we used our IRT test sets uh, and recorded the responses. And then we went and we evaluated this model um, obtained theta scores, so we wanted to see what do these scores tell us about the model. Now, um, if we look at this plot, this table, excuse me, there's a couple of things to note. Uh, on the far right, we have the test accuracy for the subsets. So, uh, you know, on the set of 30 or slightly fewer than 30 items, what was the accuracy? Uh, now, if we look at the 5GS entailment accuracy, we see that the performance is very high, 96.5%. But if we look at the theta score, we see that it's right around zero. Uh, and the nice thing about theta score is that you can convert it to a percentile because it's basically just standard deviation from a normal distribution. So um, a theta score of negative 0.1 aligns with performance that is above in the 44th percentile. So even though this accuracy was very high, up around 96%, because the performance from all the humans was also very high, the model only performed about average, even a little less than average, um, which is interesting because if you just looked at the raw accuracy metric, you would say, wow, this did a great job. But um, taking this data score into account, using your IRT model, you get a better sense of what that accuracy really means in the context of a larger population. Now. Um, the next thing I'd like to point out is the other test sets, your contradiction and your neutral test sets. <clears throat> um, as you see here, the accuracy for your 5GS test sets was higher than the accuracy for the 4GS test sets. And that kind of once again goes back to the idea that the 5GS test set was a little easier than the 4GS test set. However, if you look at the theta scores, they're pretty consistent across the test sets. So for contradiction, you have 1.539. Um, for the 5GS and 1.777 for the 4GS. If you look at the percentile wise, 93%, 96%. Uh, and then neutral is very close, very similar. You have 0.42 and 0.44. So um, what this means is that your theta score is kind of robust to the data set that you're using. Uh, it takes into consideration these item parameters when it gives you a score so that across different types of test sets, you should get a fairly uh, consistent score in terms of theta. And that's useful because that way you really, um, you know, you're not going to pick the easiest test set to kind of bump up your numbers. Um, you know that 
your score is consistent across these test sets, and that's uh, that's helpful because you have that item information. So uh, to close, um, what we did was we used item response theory to build test sets that model the characteristics of individual items. Uh, with IRT, you get a score that takes these item characteristics into account and allows you to compare your results to human performance, which is which is nice. Um, and finally, as we saw in the last slide, a raw high accuracy score doesn't imply good for performance in terms of a human population. You need to take all the human response patterns into, into account, the item characteristics into account, um, and that is something that IRT allows for you to do. Uh, with IRT, there are some limitations. Um, you do need a lot, a lot of data to fit these models. Um, the nice thing is with the crowdsourcing, like Amazon Mechanical Turk, that helps reduce the cost of data collection. Uh, there's an alternative methodology in uh, testing theory called classical test theory, where you don't need as much data, but you don't get the rich representation of items uh, on an individual item level. You just get a kind of test-centric metric, similar to you know how, how normally tests are scored. Um, and finally, the fitting of the IRT models is a manual process. As you saw, you have to iterate through, um, test the item statistics, make sure that they fit well. Um, but you can think about the item removal criteria as a set of hyperparameters. Uh, if you want to be lenient in terms of what's retained, if you want to be very strict in terms of your test set, that's something that you can set ahead of time uh, in order to you know automate more of this. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about just some of the ongoing and future work from this. Um, so first, we would like to make sure that the IRT metric is reliable and consistent for recognizing entailment. Um, you know, if it does, if it can accurately identify high-performing models uh, and distinguish them between low-performing models, that's something that's going to be very useful and kind of uh, validate the claim of the usefulness of IRT as an evaluation metric. Uh, kind of a complementary point to that is we want to know if IRT is useful for other NLP tasks. So we're also looking at IRT for sentiment analysis. Uh, and that uses a slightly different model because the responses for sentiment analysis are on like a, a graded scale. So you need um, a, just a different model. But it's we're testing it now. And hopefully, if we can conclude that it's useful there, we can kind of open it up to excuse me other tasks within NLP. Um, another area is. Um, looking at other metrics that consider ambiguity in language. So um, with our labels from Amazon Turk, we have what could be considered uh, a distribution over labels for each item based on the responses of the individuals. Um, and you can use something like Hellinger distance, which is a distance metric for probability distributions, to compare the outputs of an LP model to this kind of human distribution of labels and basically measure how well your model performs with respect to the crowd. Um, and finally, what, where we originally came up with the idea of using IRT, um, we're trying to build a new test for health literacy that uses IRT as its evaluation metric. So we're working on coming up with a set of test questions that when given to a patient can reliably measure a patient's ability to understand uh, medical concepts. Um, okay, so I still do have some time, so I'm going to talk about some of those ongoing works in a little more detail, specifically uh, around Hellinger distance. So as I mentioned, if we can treat the distribution of human-generated labels as a gold standard, then we can measure the performance of a model by calculating the distance between uh, its probability outputs for a set of labels uh, and the gold standard human probability distribution. So basically what we're doing here is trying to compare our model to the wisdom of the crowd, see how well it does with the you know, crowd uh, information. So now here we've got a little bit of math that is not uh, rendering correctly. It's okay. So for each item, you define your Hellinger distance from a probability distribution P and Q as um, 1 over 2 of the L2 norm, the difference in the squares. Uh, and then... For your test set score, you just take the sum square of the sum of the squares of the Hellinger distances for each of your items. 
Uh, and now for something like this, lower is better, whereas opposed to IRT, higher is better. So uh, one interesting thing that we looked at was comparing the probability of answering, the probability associated with the correct label in our populate human distribution with item difficulty. So I mean, you would think that if the probability of answering correctly is very high, you can consider that item as easy. Uh, and that was, that was the case. Um, so as the probability of answering correctly increased, the item difficulty dropped. So that's the kind of relationship we expected to see, but it was nice to actually see it. So next, what we wanted to do was compare ne the neural network, compare unneural network to other um, models to just see if the neural network is able to kind of learn as more training data is introduced, both in terms of our item response theory models and in terms of this new Hellinger distance. Um, so again, for the IRT bits, there is better, and then for the Hellinger distance, lower is better. So as you see here, as training data size increases, um, performance for the neural network model also increases, um, whereas for some of the other models, it kind of stays flat. Um, it may be improved slightly, but the clear uh, improvement is, is the neural network. Uh, and then we kind of see the opposite effect with the Hellinger distance. The distance decreases as the training size increases, which is what we want to see. Um, and it plays out mostly in the uh, neural network. So this is just kind of a comparison across models in terms of what can we see in terms of uh, improving performance as training size increases with our new metrics. And then we just have the same plot, but in a different representation. This tracks the cumulative change across training sizes. So uh, how much the model has improved from its original score when the training size is, is very small. Uh, and again, we see that the neural network is, is you could consider learning more in terms of uh, how much better it does than its original score, particularly with the Hellinger distance. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody for listening, and I will answer any questions.